Chapter eighty one: The Room of the Retired Baker. The evening of the day on which the Count de Morcerf had left Dengers's house with feelings of shame and anger caused by the banker's coldness, Andrea Cavalcanti, with curled hair, mustaches in perfect order, and white gloves which fitted ad- admirably, had entered the courtyard of the banker's house in La Chaussée d'Antin. He had not been more than ten minutes in the drawing room before he drew Dengers aside into the recess. Of a bow window, and after an ingenious preamble, related to him all his anxieties since his noble father's departure. He had found, he said, in the banker's family, in which he had been received as a son, all the guarantees of happiness, which went out to seek for in preference to the caprices of passion, and as regard passion itself, he had the felicity of meeting it in the lovely faces. Of Mademoiselle Danglars, Danglars listened with the most profound attention. He had expected this declaration、uh, the last two or three days, and when it at last came, his eyes glistened as much as they had lowered on listening to Morcerf. He would not, not, however, yield immediately to the young man's request, but made a few consci-、uh, conscientious scruples. Are you not rather young, Monsieur Andrea, to think of marrying? I think not, sir," replied Cavalcanti. "In Italy, the nobility generally marry young. Life is so uncertain. We ought to secure happiness while it is within our reach." "Well, sir," said Danglars, "in case your proposals, which do me honor, are accepted by my wife and my daughter, by whom shall the preliminary arrangements be settled? So important a negotiation, a negotiation should, I think." Be conducted by the respective fathers of the young people, sir. My father is a man of great foresight and prudence. Imagine I might wish to settle in France. He left me at his departure, together with the papers constituting my identity, a letter promising, if he approved of my choice, one hundred and fifty thousand livres per annum from the day I was married. As far as I can judge, I suppose this to be a quarter of my father's revenue. I said, "Danglars have always intended to give my daughter five hundred thousand francs as her dowry. She is, besides, my whole heiress. All would be easily arranged if the baroness and her daughter are willing. We should command an annuity of one hundred and seventy-five thousand livres. Supposing also I should persuade the marquis to give me my capital, which is not likely, but still possible." We would place these two or three millions in your hands, whose talent might make it realize ten percent. I never give more than four percent, and generally only three and a half. But to my son-in-law, I would give five, and we would share the profits. Very good, father-in-law," said Cavalcanti, yielding to his low-born nature, which would escape sometimes through the aristocratic gloss with which he sought to conceal it. Correcting himself immediately, he said, "Excuse me, sir. Hope alone makes me almost mad. What will not reality do?" But said Danglars, who on his part did not perceive how soon the conversation, which at first disinterested, was turning to a business transaction. There is doubtless a part of your fortune your father could not refuse you. Which, asked the young man, that you inherit from your mother. Truly, from my mother, Leonora Corsinari. How much may it amount to? Indeed, sir," said Andrea. "I assure you, I have never given the subject a thought, but I suppose it must have been at least two millions." Danglars felt as much overcome with joy as the miser who finds a lost treasure, or as the shipwrecked mariner who feels himself on the solid ground, instead of in the beast which he expected would swallow him up. Well, sir," said Andrea, bowing to the banker respectfully. "May I hope?" "You may not only hope," said Danglars, "but consider it a settled thing. If no obstacles arises on your part, I am indeed rejoiced," said Andrea. "But," said Danglars thoughtfully, "how is it that your patron, Monsieur de Monte Cristo, did not make this proposal for you?" Andrea blushed imperceptibly. "I have just left the count, sir," said he. He is doubtless a delightful man, but inconceivably singular in his ideas. He esteems me highly, 
and even told me he had not the slightest doubt that my father would give me the capital instead of the interest of my property. He has promised to use his influence to, to obtain it for But he also declared that he never had taken upon himself the responsibility of making proposals for another. And he would, never would, I must, however, do him the justice to add that he assured me. If ever he had regretted the repugnance he felt to such a step, it was on this occasion, because he thought the projected union would be a happy and suitable one. Besides, if he will do nothing officially, he will answer my question you propose to him. And now, continued he, with one of his most charming smiles, having finished talking to the father-in-law, I must address myself to the banker. And what may you have to say to him? said Danglars, laughing in his turn. That the day after tomorrow I shall have somewhere about four thousand francs to draw upon with your house. But the count, expecting my bachelor's revenue could not suffice for the increased expenses of the coming month, has offered me a draft for eighty thousand francs. It bears his, his signature, as you will see, which is all sufficient. Bring me a million such as that, said Danglars, and I shall be well pleased. Putting the draft in his pocket, fix your own hour for tomorrow, and my cashier shall call on you with a check for eighty thousand francs. At ten o'clock, then, if you please. I should like it early, as I am going into the country tomorrow. Very well, at ten o'clock. You are still at Hotel de Princes? Yes. The following morning, with the banker's usual punctuality, the eighty thousand francs were placed in the young man's hands, as he was on the point of starting. Having left two hundred francs for caterals, he went out briefly, cheaply to avoid this dangerous enemy, and returned as late as possible in the evening. But scarcely had he stepped out of his carriage when the porter met him with a parcel in his hand. Sir, said he, this man has been... What man? said Andrea carelessly, apparently forgetting him who he but too well recollected. The man to whom your excellency pays the little energy. Oh, said Andrea, my father's old servant. Well, you gave him the two hundred francs I left for him? Yes, your excellency. Andrea had expressed a wish to be thus addressed. But, continued the porter, he would not take them. Andrea turned pale. But as it was dark, no one noticed his paleness. What? He would not take them, said he with slight emotion. No, he wished to speak to your excellency. I told him you were gone out, which after some dispute he, did, he believed, and give me this letter, which he had brought with him already sealed. Give it to me, said Andrea, and he read by the light of his carriage lamp. You know where I live. I expect you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Andrea examined it carefully, to ascertain if the letter had been opened, for if any indiscreet eyes had seen its contents, but it was so carefully folded, no one could have read it, and the seal was perfect. Very well, said he. Poor man, he is a worthy creature. He left the porter to pound on these words. Not knowing which most to admire, the master or the servant. Take out the horses quickly and come up to me, said Andrea to his groom. In two seconds the young man had reached his room and burned Caderos's letter. The servant entered just as he had finished. You're about my height, Peter, said he. I have that honor, Your Excellency. You have a... You, ha you had a new livery yesterday? Yes, sir. I have an engagement with a pretty little girl for this evening, and do not wish to be known. Lend me your livery till tomorrow. I may sleep, perhaps, at the end. Peter obeyed. Five minutes after, Andrea left the hotel, completely disguised, took a cab for real attempt, ordered the driver to take him to Chabot Rouge at Picacus. The next morning he left that inn, as he had left the Hotel de Princess, without being noticed, walked down the Faubourg saint Antin, along the boulevard to Rue Menil Montant and stopping at the door of the third house on the left, looked for someone of whom to make an inquiry in the porter's absence. For whom are you looking, my, my fine fellow? Asked the futurist on the opposite side. Monsieur Palantine, if you please, my good woman, replied Andrea. A retired baker? 
asked the futurist. Exactly. He lives at the end of the yard, on the left, on the third story. Andrea went as she directed him, and on the third floor he found the hare's bell, which, by the hasty ringing of the bell, it was evident he pulled with considerable ill temper. A moment after, Caderos's face appeared at the grating in the door. Ah, oh, you're punctual, said he, as he unbolted the door. Confound you and your punctuality, said Andrea, throwing himself into the chair in a manner which implied that he would rather have flung it at the head of his host. Come, come, my dear fellow, don't be angry. See, I have thought, of, thought about you. Look at the good breakfast we're going to have. Nothing but what you are fond of. Andrea, indeed, inhaled the scent of something cooking, which was not unwelcome to him, hungry as he was. It was that mixture of, of fat and garlic peculiar to provincial kitchens of an inferior order, added to that of dried fish, and above all, the pungent smile, smell of musk and gloves. These odors escaped from two deep dishes, which were covered and placed on a stove, and from a copper pan placed in an old iron pot in an adjoining room, Andrea saw also a tolerably clean table prepared for two, two bottles of wine sealed, the one with green, the other with yellow, a considerable portion of brandy in the decanter, and a measure of fruit in the cabbage leaf, cleverly arranged on an earthenware plate. What do you think of it, my, my little fellow? said Caderos. Ah, oh, that smells good. You know, I, you know I used to be a good cook. Do you recollect how you used to lick your fingers? You were among the first who tasted any of my dishes. I did think you relished them tolerably. While speaking, Caderos went on peeling a fresh supply of onions. But, said Andrea, ill-temperedly, pardieu, if you disturbed me only to breakfast with you, the devil takes you. My boy, said Caderos, sententiously, one can talk while eating, and then, you ungrateful being, you're not pleased to see an old friend? I'm weeping with joy. He was truly crying, but it would have been difficult to say whether the joy or the onions produced the greatest effect on the uh, gland of the old innkeeper of the pond you guard. Hold your tongue, hypocrite, said Andrea. You love me. You. Yes, I do. Where may the devil take me? I know it is a weakness said Caderos, but it overpowers me. And yet it has not prevented your sending for me to play me some trick. Come, said Caderos, wiping his large knife on his apron. If I did not like you, you do you think I should endure the wretched life you lead me? Think for a moment. You have your servant's clothes on you. You, therefore, keep a servant. I have none, and I am obliged to prepare my own meals. You abuse my cookery because you dine at the table de hotel of the Hotel de Princes, or the Café de Paris. Well, I too could keep a servant. I too could have a tilbury. I too could dine where I like. But why do I not? Because I would not annoy my little Benedetto. Come, just acknowledge that, that I could, eh? This address was accompanied by a look which was by no means difficult to understand. Well, said Andrea. Admitting your love, why do you want me to breakfast with you? That I may have the pleasure of seeing you, my little fella. Of seeing me? What for? Since we have made all our arrangements. Ah, oh, dear friend, said Caderos, are wills ever made without codicils? But first of all, you came to breakfast, did you not? Well, sit down, and let's begin with these sardines, and this fresh butter which I have put on some wine leaves. To please you, you rogue. Ah, yes, you look at, at my room, my four, four straw chairs, the plaster figures, three francs each. But what do you expect? This is not the Hotel de Princes. Come, you are growing discontented. Are you no longer happy, you who only wished to appear a retired baker? Cadro sighed. Well, what have you to say? You have seen your dreams realized. I can still say it is a dream. A retired baker, my poor Benedetto, is rich. He has an annuity. Well, you have an annuity. I have. Yes, since I have your 200 francs. 
Hatteroth shrugged up his shoulders. It is humiliating, said he, thus to receive money given grudgingly, an uncertain supply which may soon fail. You, see, I am ob obliged to you a common ice. In case your prosperity should cease. Well, my friend, fortune is inconstant, as said the chaplain of the regiment. I know your prosperity is great, Rasco. You are too many the daughter of Danglers. What, of Danglers? Yes, to be sure. Must I say Baron Danglers? I might as well say Count Benedetto. He was an old friend of mine. And if he had not so bad a memory, he ought to invite me to your wedding, seeing he came to mine. Yes, yes, to mine, forsooth. He was not so proud then. He was an under clerk to the good Monsieur Morel. I have dined many times with him and the Count de Morcerf. So you see, I have some high connections. And were I to cultivate them a little, we might meet in the same drawing rooms. Come, your jealousy represents everything to you in the wrong light. That is all very fine, my Benedetto, but I know what I'm saying. Perhaps I may one day put on my best coat and present him myself at the front door, introduce myself. Meanwhile, let us sit down and eat. Carrero set the example and attacked the breakfast with a good appetite, praising each dish he set before his visitor. The latter seemed to have resigned himself. He drew the corks and partook largely of the fish with the garlic and fat. Ah, oh, comrade, said the cardinals, you're getting on better terms with your old landlord. Faith, yes, replied Andrea, whose hunger prevailed over every other feeling. So you like it, you rogue. So much would I wonder how a man who can cook thus can complain of hard living. Do you see, said the cardinals, all my happiness is married by one thought. What is that? That I am dependent on another. I who have always gained my own livelihood honestly. Do not let that disturb you. I have enough for two. No, truly, you may believe me if you will. At the end of every month, I am tormented by remorse. Good Caderos. So much so that yesterday I would not take the two hundred francs. Yes, you wish to speak to me. But was it indeed remorse? Tell me. True remorse. And besides, an idea has struck me. Andrea shuddered. He always did so at Caderos's ideas. It is miserable. Do you see? Always to wait till the end of the month. Oh, said Andrea philosophically, determined to watch his companion narrowly. Does not life pass in waiting? Do I, for instance, do anything else? Well, I wait patiently, do I not? Yes, because instead of expecting two hundred wretched francs, you expect five or six thousand perhaps ten, perhaps even twelve, for you take care not to let anyone know the utmost. Down here, you almost had little presents, and Christmas boxes, which you try to hide from your poor friend Caderos. Fortunately, he is a cunning fellow, but friend Caderos. Then you are beginning to again to ramble, to talk again and again of the past, but what is the use of so much repetition? Ah, oh, you're only one and twenty, and can forget the past. I am fifty, and I am obliged to collect it. But let us return to business. Yes. I was going to say, if I were in your place, well, I would realize... How would you realize? I would ask for six months in advance, under pretense of being able to purchase a farm. Then, with my six months, I would decamp. Well, well said Andrea. That is no bad thought. My dear friend, said Caderos, eat off my bread and take my advice. You will be none the worse off, physically or morally. But, said Andrea, why do you not act on the advice you give me? Why do you not realize a six months, a year's advance even, and retire to Brussels instead of living a retired baker? You might live as a bankrupt using his privileges. That would be very good. But how the devil would you have me retire on 1,200 francs? Ah, Caderos, said Andrea, how covetous you are, two months since you were dying with hunger. In eating the appetite grows, said Caderos, grinning and showing his teeth, like a monkey laughing or a tiger growling. And, added he, biting off, 
with those large white teeth, an enormous mouthful of bread. I have formed a plan. Caderos's plan alarmed Andrea still more than his ideas. Ideas were but a germ, but plans were reality. Let me see your plan. I dare say it is a pretty one. Why not? Who formed the plan by which we left the establishment of Monsieur... Monsieur... What's his name? Hey? Was it not I? And it was no bad one, I believe, since here we are. I do not say, replied Andrea, that you never made a good one. But let's see your plan. Well, pursued Caderos, can you, without extending one soul, put me in the way of getting 15,000 francs? No, 15,000 are not enough. I cannot again become an honest man with less than 30,000 francs. No, replied Andrea dryly. No, I cannot. I don't think you understand me, replied Caderos calmly. I said, without your laying out a soul. Do you want me to commit a robbery, to spoil all my good fortune, and yours with mine, and both of us to be dragged down there again? It would make very little difference to me, said Caderos, if I were retaken. I am a poor creature to live alone, and sometimes pine for my old camel comrades. Not like you, heartless creature, who would be glad never to see them again. Andrea did more than tremble this time. He turned pale. Come, Caderos, no nonsense, said he. Don't alarm yourself, my little Benedetto, but just join, point out to me some means of gaining those 30,000 francs without your assistance, and I will contrive it. Well, I will see. I will look out, said Andrea. Meanwhile, you will raise my monthly allowance to 500 francs. My little fellow, I have a fancy and mean to get a housekeeper. Well, you shall have your 500 francs, said Andrea. But it is very hard for me, my poor Caderos. You take advantage. Bah, said Caderos, when you have access to countless stores. One would have said Andrea anticipated his companion's words. So did his eye flash like lightning. It was but for a moment. True, he replied. And my protector is very kind. That dear protector, said Caderos. And how much does he give you monthly? Five thousand francs. As many thousand as you give me hundreds. Truly, it is only bastards who are thus fortunate. Five thousand francs per month. What the devil can you do with all that? Oh, wow. Oh, it is no trouble to spend that. I am like you. I want a capital. A capital, yes, I understand. Everyone would like a capital. Well, and I shall get one. Who will give it to you? Your prince? Yes, my prince. But unfortunately, I must wait. You must wait for what? For his death. The death of a prince? Yes. How so? Because he has made his will in my favor. Indeed. On my honor. For how much? For five hundred thousand. Only that? That's, a little, that's little enough. But so it is. No, it cannot be. Are you my friend, Carlos? Yes, in life or death. Well, I will tell you a secret. What is it? But remember... Ah, pardieu, mute as a carp. Well, I think... Andrea stopped and looked around. You think? Do not fear, we are alone. I think I have discovered my father. Your true father? Yes. Not old Calvin Candy? No, for it's gone again. The true one, as you say. Well, that father is... Well, Caderos, it is Monte Cristo. Bah! Yes, you understand. That explains all. He cannot acknowledge me openly, it appears, but he does it through Monsieur Cavalcanti and gives him 50,000 francs for it. 50,000 francs for being your father? I would have done it for half of that, for 20,000, or 15,000. Why did you not think of me, ungrateful man? Did I know anything about it? When it was all done when I was down there. Ah, truly. And you say that by his will, he leaves me 500,000 livres. And you're sure of it? He showed it me. But it is not all. There's a codicil. And as I said just now, probably. And in that codicil, he acknowledges me. Oh, what a good father. An excellent father. 
What a very honest father, said Caderos, twirling a plate in the air between his two hands. Now, say if I conceal anything from you. No, and your confidence makes you honorable in my opinion. And your princely father, is he rich? Very rich? Yes, in truth. He does not himself know the amount of his fortune. It's impossible. It is evident enough to me, who am always at his house. The other day, a banker's clerk brought him 50,000 francs in a portfolio about the size of your plate. Yesterday, his banker brought him 100,000 francs in gold. Caderos was filled with wonder. The young man's words sounded to him like a meadow, and he thought he could hear the rustling of cascades of Louis. Are you going to that house? cried he briskly. When I like. Caderos was thoughtful for a moment. It was easy to perceive he was resolving some important idea in his mind. Then suddenly, how I should like to see all that, cried he. How beautiful it must be. It is, in fact, magnificent, said Andrea. And does he not live in the Champs-Élysées? Yes, number 30. Ah, said Caderos, number 30. Yes, a fine house standing alone, between courtyard and the garden. You must know it. Possibly. But is it not the exterior I care for? It is the, ex- it is the interior. What beautiful furniture there must be in it. Have you ever seen the Tuileries? No. Well, it surpasses that. It must be worth one's while to stoop, Andrea. When that good Monsieur Monte Cristo lets fall his purse. It is not worth while to wait for that, said Andrea. Money is as plentiful in that house as fruit in an orchid. But you should take me there one day with you. How can I? On what plea? You're right. But you have made my mouth water. I must absolutely see it. I shall find a way. No nonsense, Caderos. I will offer myself as a full tour. The rooms are all carpeted. Well then, I must be contented to imagine it. That's the best plan, believe me. Try, at least, to give me an idea of what it is. How can I? Nothing is easier. Is it large? Middling. How is it arranged? Faith. I should require pen, ink, and paper to make a plan. They're all here, said Caderos briskly. He fetched from an old secretaire a sheet of white paper and pen and ink. Here, said Caderos, trace me all that on the paper, my boy. Andrea took the pen with an imperceptible smile and began. The house, as I said, is between the court and the garden. In this way, do you see? Andrea traced the garden, the court, and the house. High walls? Not more than eight or ten feet. That's not prudent, said Caderos. In the court are orange trees in pots, turf, and clumps of flowers. And no steel traps? No. The stables? Are on either side of the gate, which you see there. And Andrea continued his plan. Let us see the ground floor, said Caderos. On the ground floor, dining room, two drawing rooms, billiard room, staircase in the hall, and a little back staircase. Windows? Magnificent windows, so beautiful, so large, that I believe a man of your size would pass through each frame. Why, the devil! Have they any stairs with such windows? Luxury has everything. But shutters? Yes, but they are never used. That Count of Monte Cristo is an original, who loves to look at the sky even at night. And where do the servants sleep? Oh, they have a house on themselves. Picture to yourself a pretty coach house at the right-hand side, where the ladders are kept. Well, over that coach house are the servants' rooms, with bells corresponding with the different apartments. Ah, the devil! Bells! What do you say? Oh, nothing. I only say they cost a lot of money to hang. And what is the use of them, I should like to know? There used to be a dog let loose in the yard at night, but it has been taken to the house at Audrey. To that you went to, you know. Yes. I was saying to him only yesterday, you are imprudent, Monsieur le Comte, for when you go to Autry, you take your servants. The house is left unprotected. Well, said he, what next? Well, next, some day you'll be robbed. And what did he answer? He quietly said, what do I care if I am? Andrea, he has some secret here with a spring. How do you know? Yes, which catches a thief in the trap and plays a tune. I was told there was such at the last exhibition. 
He is simply a mahogany secretaire in which the key is always kept. And he is not robbed. No, his servants are all devo devoted to him. Yeah. There ought to be some money in that secretaire. There may be. No one knows what there is. And where is it? On the first floor. Sketch me a plan of that floor, as we have done of the ground floor, my boy. That's very simple. Andrea took the pen. On the first story, do you see, there is that empty room and the drawing room. To the right of the drawing room, a library with a study. To the left, a bedroom and a dressing room. The famous secretary is in the dressing room. Is there a window in the dressing room? Two. One here and one there. Andrea sketched two windows in the room, which formed an angle on the plan, and appeared a smaller square added to the long square of the bedroom. Catarros became thoughtful. Does he often go to Altui? added he. Two or three times a week. Tomorrow, for instance, he is going to spend all day and all night there. Are you sure of it? He has invited me to dine there. There is a life for you, said Catarros, a townhouse and a country house. That is what it is to be rich. And you shall dine there? Probably. When you dine there, do you sleep there? If I like, I am not at home there. Catarros looked at the young man, as if to get the truth from the bottom of his heart. But Andrea drew a cigar case from his pocket, took a Havana, quietly lit it, and began smoking. When do you want your five hundred francs? said he to Catarose. Now, if you have them. Andrea took five and twenty louis from his pocket. Yellow boys, said Catarose. No, I thank you. Oh, you despise them. On the contrary, I esteem them, but I will not, but will not have them. You will make a profit on them, idiot. Gold is worth five sous per premium. Exactly. And he who changes them will follow friend Catarus, lay hands on him, and demand what farmer pays him their rent in gold. Nonsense, my good fellow. Silver simply, round coins with the head of some monarch or some or other on them. Anybody may possess a five franc piece. But do you suppose I carry five hundred francs about with me? I should want a porter. Well, leave them with your porter. He is to be trusted. I will call for them. Today? No, tomorrow. I shall not have time today. Well, tomorrow I will leave them when I go to Audrey. May I depend on it? Certainly. Because I shall secure my housekeeper on the strength of it. Secure her? But with, but with, but will that all? But will that be all? Ah, you will not torment me any more. Never. Cateros had become so gloomy that Andrea feared he should be obliged to notice the change. He redoubled his gaiety and carelessness. How sprightly you are, said Cateros. One would say you were already in possession of your property. No, unfortunately, but when I do obtain it... Well, I shall remember old friends, I only tell you that. Yes, since you have such a good memory. What do you want? I thought you had ransomed me. I? What an idea. I, who am going to give you another piece of good advice. What is it? To leave behind you the diamond you have on your finger. We shall both get in trouble. You will ruin both yourself and me by your folly. How so? said Andrea. How? You put a livery. You disguise yourself as a servant, and yet keep a diamond on your finger worth four or five thousand francs. You guess well. I know nothing of diamonds. I have had some. You do well to boast of it, said Andrea, who, without becoming angry, as Cateros feared, at his new extortion, quietly resigned the ring. Cateros looked so closely at it that Andrea well knew that he was examining if all the edges were perfect. It is a false diamond, said Cateros. You're joking now, replied Andrea. Don't be angry. You can try it. Cateros went to the window, touched the glass with it, and found it would cut. Covertor, said Cateros, putting a diamond on his little finger. I was mistaken, but those thieves of jewelry imitate so well that it is no longer worthwhile to rob a jeweler's shop. It is another branch of industry paralyzed. Have you finished just now? said Andrea. Do you want anything more? Will you have my waistcoat or my certificate? Make free now you have begun. No, you are, after all, a good fellow. 
I will not detain you and will try to cure myself of my ambition. But take care the same thing does not happen to you in selling the diamond you feared with gold. I shall not sell it. Do not fear. Not at least till the day after tomorrow, thought the young man. Happy rogue, said Caderose. You're going to find your servants, your horses, your carriages, and your betrothed. Yes, said Andrea. Well, I hope you will make a handsome wedding present the day you marry Mademoiselle Danglars. I have already told you it is a fancy you have mis- you have taken in your head. What fortune has he? But I tell you, a million? Andrea shrugged up his shoulders. Let it be a million, said the Caderos. You can never have so much as I wish you. Thank you, said the young man. Oh, I wish it you with all my heart, said the Caderos, with his hoarse laugh. Stop, let me show you the way. It's not worth while. Yes, it is. Why? Because there is a little secret, a precaution I thought it desirable to take, one of Herod and Fitch's locks, revised and improved by Gaspard Caderos. I will manufacture you a similar one when you are a capitalist. Thank you, said Andrea. I will let you know a week beforehand. They parted. Caderos remained on the landing until he had not only seen Andrea go down three stories, but also cross the court. Then he returned hastily shut his door carefully and began to study, like a clever architect, the plan Andrea left him. Dear Benedetto, said he, I think he will not be sorry to inherit his fortune, and he who hastens the day when he can touch his five hundred thousand will not be his worst friend.